Howdy folks, Jambreaky here, and it's time to dive into a movie that lost Disney over 30 million dollars. Yikes. Based on the classic cartoon show, Inspector Gadget is about John Brown, a security officer who guards a robotic science lab for Dr. Artemis Bradford and his daughter Dr. Brenda Bradford. One night, the evil villain Claw of Skolex Industries steals a robot foot from the Bradford lab and assassinates Artemis. John tries to go after Claw in his car, but the Crooked Claw cruelly blows John up in an explosion. With John on the edge of death, Brenda agrees to use her dad's technology to save him, transforming the everyman John Brown into Inspector Gadget. It's down to this new android hero to uncover Claw's identity and stop him from creating an army of robo gadgets to sell to world militaries. Let's get something straight first. This movie barely resembles the original Inspector Gadget cartoon. It takes ideas and names from the TV show, but the overall execution is kind of different which is a common criticism against a lot of movies based on cartoons. The OG Inspector Gadget cartoon is about this bumbling detective who tries to take his job seriously, but is totally disaster prone. Think Frank Drebin from Naked Gun. It's actually Gadget's niece Penny and her dog Brain who do most of the real work. It's a contrasting dynamic that makes for funny comedy and gives kids watching a hero their age. This movie though, well, it's kind of like Disney randomly picked out a stock script for a family film and slapped Inspector Gadget's branding on top for presentation. A big hindrance to the movie as an adaptation has to be the inclusion of movie original character Brenda. While I'm all for Brenda being this smart and talented scientist for little girls to aspire towards, it's a high-powered processor chip that increases the charge in the human brainwave enough to move the machinery that's now built into your body. The problem is that she steals a lot of screen time from Penny and Brain. The issues are that she steals Penny and Brain's deserved screen time, and the movie mainly uses her as a trophy love interest for our male hero to make sure that he's masculated. First, it means that Penny and Brain, the real heroes of the cartoon, go very, very underused. The only things that Penny gets to do are, one, point out a clue that anyone with eyes could notice, two, convince a henchman to turn good, with said minion only being useful as a witness to Claw's crimes. Next thing you know, you're a minion. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brain, well, the best thing he gets to do is rip off Claw's underpants. Gadgetmobile actually gets more to do than Brain and Penny, and he's supposed to be a regular normal car in the cartoon. Secondly, there's literally no cute chemistry between John and Brenda. Our supposed hero can be quite the stalker, and all of John's attraction is pretty shallow and lustful. Whenever John talks to Brenda personally, he makes everything about himself. I just applied to the Riverton Police Force. Yeah. It's what I've always wanted to do. He just offered me a job. He said that I would have unlimited funding, my own lab, and complete control of all my research. But what about your other research? The gadget program. Then, whenever he dreams about Brenda, it's all weirdly horny for a family movie. Even when you brush aside the changes during adaptation, this is still a bad film, folks. Now, sure, the movie 100% commits to having a cartoony tone. The movie has created its very own world, and the story being told fits that world. The problem, though, is the actual delivery of said cartooniness. The movie goes so, so ham on its zany comedy that it all comes off as downright obnoxious. From the annoying scene transition effects... What kind of a cyber freak are we dealing with? <laughs> natural and poorly edited reaction shots of extras. <laughs> Every single scene scrapes the barrel to force some kind of slapstick into the moment. This comedy formula is so contrived that you can see the setup before the punchline miles away. Like, why does toothpaste come out when John says go go gadget oil slick? Oh, because the blue paint looks messier on camera? Why does the guru place two balls on the ground for John's training scene? Well, so we can have a nut grab shot for cheap giggles. Why is an advanced Android spy gear the equivalent of a kid's cup and string phone? So we can have a weird spanking the fat lady gag? Of course. Look, I remember laughing really hard at these jokes as a kid for sure. And I get why children would giggle at these scenes. They love seeing characters being humiliated or hurt. But once I got older, 
I started to realise how amateur and weak these jokes really are. So what about the main story of the film? Surely the investigation at hand is exciting to follow, right? Well, first of all, it makes no sense why the police reject using Inspector Gadget and call him a publicity stunt? Um, what? You have a Swiss army man on the force and see no value to him? And publicity stunt? Why transform a dying man into a super robot for publicity? Anyway, once John, despite apparently being a lowly PR gimmick, very, very easily gets his hands on the Bradford case files, he finds a piece of evidence with the letters S and I on it, which could mean anything, right? Then, in the next scene, a Skolex Industries truck just conveniently rolls up beside our heroes, and Penny points out the initials. That's it. Case closed. No, really. No more investigator needed. I never noticed how underwhelming this movie's crime sleuthing really is. There's no real tension or slow build-up. Heck, when it's Brenda's turn to uncover the truth, she doesn't even get a chance to play detective. No, for some bizarre reason, Claw creepily has his own annoying Brenda sex bot, who somehow escaped his lab, and only exists in the film to dump all the truth onto Brenda. All Sandy ever wants to talk about is that gross foot. <laughs> What foot? The one he stole and copied to make me. Hey, can we really look at the meat of Claw's scheme? All I could do is raise questions. Wouldn't sending Robo Gadget into the city to cause mass destruction be bad business? Not only would this make Claw's dealings way less discreet, but I'm sure that armies would be put off from buying a product with a bad reputation, an unpredictable personality, and a hostility towards authority figures. Eyewitnesses told me that he was laughing while he maliciously stacked these four cars. What's gone wrong? Other reports indicate that he's already caused a major traffic accident, destroyed private property, and set fire to an elderly man's beard. I'm sorry, but Mr. Skolex did not think his evil plan through. I also didn't like how, throughout the film's case, the movie kept changing its mind about John Brown's intelligence and capabilities. Sometimes the movie wants him to be a clueless idiot for its forced comedy, but other times, he conveniently has great knowledge of his gadgets. Heck, in the finale, he comes up with a very creative way to outwit Claw, but then he suddenly acts like he's never read the manual for his hardware before. Go, go, gadget airbrakes! Go, 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 gadget airplane! Please. You can't have it both ways, movie. Right, I've put it off for long enough, but let's address the casting for this movie. Now, don't get me wrong, most of the casting is pretty decent. Nothing inspired, but many actors do fit their roles just fine. However, the film also suffers from some of the worst miscasting in Hollywood history. We have the bizarre pick of Matthew Broderick as Inspector Gadget. For some reason, studios used to love casting Broderick as dashing leads, but he never really fit the part. He's a baby-faced and nasal-voiced guy, with very nervous mannerisms. Look, I'm not saying that Broderick is a bad actor. I think he's exceptionally good at playing Weasley villains. That is where his strength lies. From his despicable role as a lecherous teacher in the cult movie Election. Some people, they get stung, it's no big deal. Me, I swell up. There's not much time left until late period. I have other things going on too, you know. To providing the creepy voice of Joseph Sugarman in Bojack Horseman. How am I supposed to sell sugar and keep my secretary's self-esteem afloat when you're having honest-to-goodness fits of hysteria? Don't yell, father! Broderick can act, but you have to use him wisely. While Matthew is okay at playing John as a nerdy security guard because that fits him. How do I look? Like a geek from Kansas who became a security guard. He never really passes himself off as a charming comedy superhero. Go, go, gadget, oil slick. Toothpaste. The film needed someone more confident and self commanding, but also talented at physical comedy, like Brendan Fraser, Robin Williams, or Michael Keaton, actors who were considered for the part at the start. However, Broderick was also cast as John's evil clone, Robo Gadget. And you know what? I actually love Matthew's over-the-top, scenery-chewing performance. He's a Looney Tune in a trench coat. You know how to dance, don't you? Actually, I was taking lessons not long ago in the hope that Shut one Shut up day and I might... dance! Uh-oh. Not only does Broderick excel more as a slimy baddie than a plucky hero, but he's also basically a cartoon villain brought to live-action life. And it's the only performance that comes close to the movie's overall tone. <laughs> The other weak link in the casting has to be Rupert Everett as Claw. Claw is supposed to be this mysterious and imposing figure shrouded in mystery, but Rupert, 
who is best known for his flamboyance, plays him like a pantomime baddie. <laughs> sure, he nails the campiness of a cartoon villain, but he's missing that threatening menace. His claw hand is carrying a lot of the intimidation. Very clever indeed. Claw is this murderous criminal tycoon, yet Rupert is channeling fun uncle energy. It looks so real. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I get the feeling that Disney were way too afraid to make Claw too scary for kids, even though they have a history of terrifying baddies in their own rogues catalog. At the time of the movie's release, audiences maybe couldn't tell apart the computer effects from the animatronics and models, but today, a lot of the CGI looks rusty. Yet this movie's supposed to be very cartoony, but even its cartoony CGI effects can be, well, oh dear. The practical effects and puppetry, which were supervised by the legendary Stan Winston, are pretty dang cool though. We have our villain's menacing crab-like claw that functions effectively as a Bond-style artificial hand. There's lots of doubles for Matthew Broderick that have been moulded decently, and Gadget's extendable hand is a cute little effect as well. It's the Gadgetmobile that I love the most though. While this character is mainly portrayed as a CGI mascot, who is here to fill Disney's cliche wisecracking comic relief voiced by a comedian quota, Speed limits are for cars, not the Gadgetmobile. The car's headlights and bumper are performed through adorable animatronics. I actually wish that the Gadgetmobile had no voice, because the puppetry is charming enough as it is. It reminds me of the iconic British character Brum. To conclude, Inspector Gadget is a film with a heap of ambition, but no magic, charm or inspiration. It's an obnoxious, cliche ridden and inappropriately sexual film that fails to understand why the OG cartoon became timeless. But what did you think of this movie? Let everyone know in the comments below. I've been Jambariki, cheerio folks. <laughs>